It's a Tuesday, January 18th, and the time for your body this today morning news update. An injunction has been filed before the High Court seeking to have Wednesday's general election called off. Philip Kitlin of the Barbados Sovereignty Party said it was unreasonable to allow an election in the midst of a pandemic. He is arguing that a President Dame Sandra Mason unreasonably exercised her discretionary powers by accepting Prime Minister Mia Motley's election call on December 27th. He also claims that the exclusion of more than 5,000 COVID-19 positive citizens from the election breaches Section 6 of the Representation of the People Act, which enshrines the rights of eligible residents and citizens to vote. Kitlin is being represented by human rights attorney Lalu Hanuman. Uh, but I see this as a fundamental human rights issue. People have been dying for years for the right to vote, fighting, I mean, in South Africa, in Palestine, all over the world. In, in right here in the Caribbean, people have been fighting for, the, for universal adult suffrage. And uh, we can't just allow it to be taken away and, and do nothing about it. So it's from the human rights perspective that I've got involved. Something like 5,000 electors will be deprived of the right to vote. And of course, a lot of those electors live in, 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 in various constituencies around St. Michael because of the fact that um, people are living in uh, crowded conditions and traveling on ZRs and so on. So those constituencies will be heavily impacted in terms of electors not being able to vote because um, it means that um, you know quite often there's a, there's a majority of a matter of a, of, of a couple hundred in between the winner and the, and the loser and um, five thousand people not being allowed to vote could obviously make a huge difference. So we are also saying that elections wouldn't be free and fair because people are deprived of the right to vote and also because the results won't reflect the reality because people haven't been able to um, attend the polling stations. The political leader of the Alliance Party for Progress has taken the Prime Minister to task on the handling of thousands of Barbadians who will not be allowed to vote on Wednesday because they are COVID-19 positive. Bishop Joseph Arthur Lee said he was astonished that the Prime Minister had not addressed the nation regarding the more than 5,000 people in home isolation who will not be able to exercise their franchise. According to the Electoral and Boundaries Commission, no one in isolation would be allowed to leave their place and go to the polls to vote under the Ministry of Health's COVID-19 directives. I am flabbergasted that up until this up until this moment, Prime Minister has chosen not to say anything to the people of Barbados over the fact that her party, which have been the cause of universal adult suffrage in Barbados years ago, um, has said nothing to the people of Barbados who will be disenfranchised in this election. Today, the numbers stand as I understand it, at about 5,000 people who are isolated in quarantine and who therefore do not have a right to vote due to no fault of their own. Uh, I think it's a sad thing that the Prime Minister has said only to the people of Barbados. She has to take some briefings on the matter. She did that about two weeks ago, or a week and a half ago. But as far as we know, nothing else since then. And that there are 5,000 people from the official figures this franchise right now. By the time this election rolls around uh, on Wednesday, we could be up to 7 or 8,000. Who knows? Depending on the spread. Deputy APP leader Lynette Eastman also weighed in on the issue. She told Barbados today there were ways to facilitate persons in home isolation being able to vote. You get there, you set up your table or whatever it is. It could be a mobile booth that you just take out and you put there and the person can come, vote, mark their X and drop it in the ballot box. And the ECB officials would be there who, who we should trust, and also the security officer to make sure that somebody don't run off with the box or something like that. There's a suggestion that changes could be made to the electoral process following Wednesday's poll. It's coming from Chairman of the Electoral and Boundaries Commission, Leslie Haynes QC, following calls for systems to be put in place to allow COVID-19 positive persons in isolation to vote. During a media briefing on Monday, Haynes said, as has been the case after all general elections, a review will be carried out to determine what recommendations can be made for future polls. After every election, the EBC carries out a postmortem. 
the post-mortem that will be carried out perhaps after this election will be because of because of the particular circumstances of this election the post-mortem that will be carried out will perhaps be one of the most important post-mortems that we've had in relation to general elections over the years COVID-19 is not something I dare say that the that the commission anticipated um, and the, the protocols being enforced but of course the unusual the unusual or the thing unusual things happen so that yes the way the post-mortem will be carried out will depend on what happens on election day what happened on special polling day and the post-mortem will be carried out and all options rest assured that all options will be put on the table whether they're and, and then those options will be reviewed to determine whether they are practical whether they are reasonable whether how costly they are etc there's regional and international news after this short break hi i am onika i am a mother i'm a daughter and i'm a wine educator when vaccines first came on the scene last year, I was really apprehensive about getting vaccinated. I was worried about taking a drug that I felt was experimental. So at first, I really wasn't about it. I decided to get vaccinated. I had to acknowledge the fact that I am asthmatic and my son is also asthmatic. I have a career in wine. We depend on our senses and I decided that I did not want to risk it for being afraid of taking a vaccine. Coronavirus has affected everyone around the globe. And keeping this in mind, make sure that your decision is not a selfish one and that you're thinking of the benefits of the whole. Let's roll up our sleeves and get back to living. To news from the region, health officials in Guyana on Monday confirmed that 15 children have died as a result of COVID-19 since the country recorded its first case of the virus in March 2020. More from news source, Guyana. 15 children have lost their lives to the virus since the beginning of the pandemic in Guyana, with four of those deaths recorded less than a week ago. Three of those children who died recently passed away before arriving at a hospital, and an investigation has been launched into their deaths. For the others, the health ministers today said that some had pre-existing conditions, while the other cases are still on the probe. For some of those uh, children that would have been hospitalized, we know for sure some of the comorbidities that they've had and the challenges because some of them the prognosis was poor with the underlying disease and then they got COVID so that compounded and or complicated the problem. The health minister has assured that continuous monitoring will be done. Within the ministry we have a small committee of doctors who are going to get these charts and review them more thoroughly and do some interviews with the uh, family of these children. So hopefully that will give us a better understanding of what is happening. It is unclear how many children in total are currently positive with COVID-19, but the Ghana Teachers Union today announced that it knows of at least 165 children who have tested positive for the virus in the past two weeks alone. The International Labour Organization has downgraded its forecast for labour market recovery in 2022. The ILO's World Employment and Social Outlook Trends 2022 comes as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to have a significant impact on global labor markets. Here is the ILO's Director General, Guy Ryder. But I think the main finding of our report is that the labor market recovery from the COVID-19 crisis is incomplete, uh, it is fragile and it's uneven. So we expect in 2022 uh, that the number of hours actually worked in the global economy uh, will still be considerably below pre-pandemic level. And that represents effectively the loss of 52 million full-time job equivalents. So we're not even back to the starting point. So that's the incomplete nature. Uneven as well, because largely due to the uneven rollout of vaccines, due to unequal stimulus capacity because of 
different financial capacities. Some countries, some regions are doing better than others. So the rich world, uh, Europe and North America, is getting back to pre-pandemic levels more quickly. Uh, some regions are doing uh, less well. And the uncertainty comes from the fact that we are facing inflationary pressures, supply chain blockages, which means, well, things might continue to improve, but they could also go quite badly wrong as well. That's news. But for the very latest, visit us at www.barbadistoday.bb. You can also subscribe to our e-paper, email updates, or like us on Facebook, and sign up for our breaking news alerts via WhatsApp. We're also on Izumi Media in bus terminals, as well as screenplay at supermarkets and gas stations near you. And you can also hear us on Mix 96.9 FM and Capital Media HD 99.3 FM.